I'm Dr. Marco Bartos. I'm assistant professor in health uh, communication here in AUB. And I have the pleasure to introduce you to the wonderful speaker that we have here today. So first of all, I would like to introduce Dr. Luis Fernandez Duque. He's an expert in digital health with 14 years of experience. He graduated from his PhD at the University of Tromso, Norway. Correct me if my pronunciation of Norwegian is not right. In uh, 2014. Uh, he's studying, he's, he's doing research on, um, he's done research on the University of Minnesota and the University, University of Harvard. He has worked in digital health projects in Europe, USA, Africa, Middle East, and Asia, providing him a global view on the topic. He is a member of the International Medical Informatics Association and the IEEE senior member. His areas of expertise include mobile and online health. Currently, he works uh, at the Qatar Computing Research Institute studying the use of e-health for diabetes and obesity. So please welcome Dr. Uh, Fernandez Luque. Then next, we have uh, Lina Bumrad, director of the National e-health program and the Ministry of Public Health here in Lebanon. She has more than 20 years of experience in the field of health, health information system and lecturer is, she is also a lecturer at the Faculty of Public Health in the Lebanese University. She holds an MBA uh, a degree in the health management field from Paris First University, Panthéon-Sorbonne. Uh, she's a leading e-government and digital transformation projects to create new business models and culture to promote transparency and ensure modernization of the administration. She's an expert in strategic planning, business process re-engineering, and ch change management with a focus on government, pharmaceuticals, and digital media and communication platforms. She is a member of several committees, including Digital Transformation Strategy, Good Governance, Unified e Prescription, Drugs Barcode, and uh, Fighting Corruption. She has received many excellence awards, including the Best Government e Services and Golden Smart Applications. So please welcome Ms. Lina Bumrad. Then we have um, Matthias, Andre Matthias Muller, is a researcher in e health, e -he and m health related to physical activity and sedentary behavior. During his PhD in Malaysia, he developed and evaluated an ML exercise intervention. At the University of Southampton, UK, he co-developed a digital behavior health interventions and gained qualitative research skills. Currently, he works at the School of Public Health, National University of Singapore. He and this university investigates the determinants of physical activity and sedentary behavior in Asian populations to inform the development of ENML interventions. Due to his strong collaborative ties with colleagues from various regions, he supports the development of respective research initiatives in low middle income countries. So please welcome Dr. Andrea Matthias Muller. Then we have Mr. Jihad Fleyan, is general manager of Nextcare Lebanon. Uh, he is responsible for developing strategic planning and recommending technological and financial opportunities, ensuring the company's strategy and objectives are met. Jihad has supervised and headed the steady, uh, steady growth of next care in Lebanon year on year through effective planning and monitoring on the assigned accountabilities. The company is today the leading third party administrator in Lebanon, offering an array of solutions and services tailor made to the need of the customer. Jihad holds over 11 years of experience in the insurance industry and is committed on driving management's effectiveness throughout this current and future journey. Jihad is a graduate of the Lebanese American University with a BA in business administration. Welcome also to Dr. Jihad. And last but not least, welcome also Jeff. Uh, Jeff is a project manager and uh, so Jeff, uh, sorry, um, Jeff Harman. Jeff Harman from Epic is a project manager and clinical lead at, lead at Epic. He has experience in, in implementing software and community, multi-hospital and academic medical centers in the United States, Europe and Middle East. Jeff graduated from the University of Chicago in 2009 with degrees in biological sciences and economics. So with this uh, array of speakers, we'd like to talk about three main pillars, let's say, in e-health development. One is the efficiency, one other is the equity, another one is the empowerment. So these are the three E's that we'd like to focus on. So I'd like to welcome the first speaker, please, Dr. Luque, and, and give his uh, perspective on this aspect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Do you hear me? Yes, no? So I'm going to speak a little bit about my experience in the use of technology, mainly within the content of health crisis, and I will also explain a little bit things that we are doing currently in Qatar. Uh, I started to work in this area of health crisis before I went to Qatar, actually in the year 2006-15. There was the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, and the European Commission sponsored one of the biggest clinical trials for a vaccination of uh, Ebola, uh, 
The main reason why I got interested into this is because I was working on misinformation regarding health. And I did that in anorexia, in diabetes, and then I was looking also into diabetes, well, sorry, into Ebola. Uh, in USA, there were people selling natural cures for Ebola. Actually, they were exporting the cures uh, to West African countries, and they said that they were as experimental as the Ebola vaccination. There were also rumors in some uh, countries, uh, for example, in Nigeria, and there is a letter in BNC, people reporting that drinking salty water can prevent you from getting Ebola. And there was no Ebola in Nigeria, by the way. People died because of that with kidney failure. Then the FDA was, try was sending letters to that company, don't sell those things to West Africa, and then they created a campaign in social media. So there were many rumors happening. And in the Ebola vaccination project was involved, that is, it was called EBODAC. The London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine was involved in the communication part of it. So we work with them to develop some idea how we can get information of what is happening on the ground in terms of misinformation so that we can inform them and they can adjust the communication plan for the Ebola vaccination because there were many rumors happening. Uh, one thing that is actually very good in Africa and in Europe is a nightmare is to get feedback from the people. People don't want to reply surveys, etc. but in Africa it's actually working quite well because the mobile phone is actually your bank. A lot of people don't have bank accounts, they don't have credit cards, but they exchange money through the credit of your mobile phone. So actually low income setting context may have more tools that we have in very high income. In particular, there was one company called Geopost that there was, they have over 90% of the population coverage and basically they send you surveys and then if you reply, you get credit. In that way, they can very easily ask things in the entire country. And in the context of the Ebola response, they were using that services, for example, to know if there were problems with food security in rural areas, in remote areas. Imagine in the context of the Ebola outbreak, sending people to find out if there is food in the remote areas can be lethal. So that was actually a very good tool. So we say we can use the same thing and try to ask what are the fears, uh, rumors that are circulating. We put that into the European proposal, then it was a project. We had the protocol, everything ready. And then, as you can imagine, we had to go to the Ministry of Public Health in Sierra Leone we went to, with that idea, and they say, no way you will do it. They just say, forget it. No question asked, you will not do it. Anybody has a guess why? Any, anybody wants to guess why we couldn't use that cheap and easy to reach technology to ask people if they had uh, hear about rumors or misinformation about Ebola? Access? No. <laughs> they, hmm? Contagious? No, they were mostly afraid that if you ask about rumors, you may actually spark the population to look for rumors. So actually, if you don't explain, then they may start asking, why should I be worried about that? What is happening, etc." So they were very afraid of the communication implications of using technology without face that can try to reduce the fear. Uh, but uh, still, rumors they were a huge problem. Uh, so what we did instead, we collected, we created a database with more than 80 newspapers from the region, and we were automatically collecting all the newspaper, all the articles related to Ebola and Ebola vaccination. And then we were, try we were trying to use some machine learning tools to try to detect if there were negative news regarding Ebola vaccination or the Ebola response or positive views, and that didn't work either, either. Because in many of those sentiment analysis that you do to analyze whether it's positive or negative, it doesn't work in a context where negative is the normal thing. Because in Ebola, everything's very negative. So it was very hard to train machine learning for that. But we created a system that it was much easier to track if there were misinformation. And there were things like, like this in 
uh, in Liberia, there was a missile outbreak and many, they reported in that article that many mothers they were refusing to give the missile vaccination to their children because they believed that was part of a cover up operation for the Ebola vaccination trials. And people thought that to test the vaccination for Ebola, first you need to give Ebola to people. So, and that was killing people because they have a missile outbreak. Once we found that, we told the communication team in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and they changed the communication plan to make more sure that there are a, a special materials so that they don't get confused with the regular vaccination. And also the vaccination plan was adjusted not to overlap with the regular vaccination. Uh, in this context, we also realize that there is a very high risk that rumors in one country spread to another one. That's why we started to also monitor what was happening in Ghana. Uh, in Ghana, they have another trial to, to measure the immunity response to the vaccination. That was already done in Europe, but they wanted to do also in a regional population. What happened in there is that somebody created a blog post a blog that was called the Coalition for Ghana Independence and was actually saying that uh, Western <coughs> companies are using Ghana uh, people as a Guinea pigs for our Ebola trial. They started to spark also rumors that they are giving a lot of money for g getting into the trial with the mobile phone. They were very also complaining that it's very obscure. They haven't uh, explained anything actually the main reason why they didn't explain much is because it wasn't finally approved. From that blog, went to the a sensationalist media, and from there to the politicians, then to the parliament, so the whole trial got a stop. So the, it never happened. Uh, what we did was to analyze the critiques to the Ebola trial, the rebuttal, which was more like the response for, from the health officials, and you can see, um, I don't know what is this button for, sorry, that sometimes there were huge delays between the rumors and the response from a health communication point of view. Sometimes it was because somebody was traveling, other time because it's not so clear how much you can do community engagement before the trial really happened. Also one thing that we found is that the vocabulary that the people against the vaccination trial were using was very different from the authorities. And you can see, for example, people complaining about the incentive, then many people with their rebuttals, like saying that this is something uh, good for the country, etc. They were just saying like the other people are ignorant, they don't know anything about science. So it was really a antagonized point of view, but the fact is at the end, the whole thing uh, got a stop. And this is something that really happened real time one of the challenges we face, and that's also related to the topic, is that we did this as part of a research project, but to do this in a regular basis is very time consuming. It's something that requires a lot of expertise, and there are no tools to dis design to overcome this problem. In Qatar, in the Qatar uh, Computing Research Institute, we are also working another project that's called ADER, where we collect social media real time within the context of a disaster and we help to classify those millions of Twitter posts or whatever so that they can, the humanitarian organization can know whether it's about building damage, whether it's they are reporting injured people somewhere or just playing a spam so that they can analyze this information much faster. Uh, and as you can imagine, it's quite a complex process because sometimes you can have thousands thousands, a hundred of thousands of data points in a minute, so the humanitarian agency don't have tools to really analyze that knowledge. And there is also a lot of noise, and sometimes people are spreading rumors in social media. So it's very, track, very tricky to use this type of information to help uh, inform decision makers in the health domain or humanitarian response. Just to finalize, few key points. Uh, Right now we are living in a digital world. You may hate it or you may like it, but that's happening. Mothers are sharing rumors about vaccination in WhatsApp or uh, 
parents can do the same, but this is happening. Digital technologies are there in the general public. It's not so easy, and you actually need to create tools that are easy to use. Sometimes computer scientists, we come with something very complicated and will never be useful because they need to understand how to use this information. And the healthcare professionals don't really know how to tackle this uh, overwhelming amount of information. Empowerment, with mobile and online technologies, we have the capacity to reach the whole population of most of it, but we need to be very aware that not everybody has the same technology. And we need to think how it's being used local. For example, in Spain, nobody uses Instagram. It's very few people. In Qatar, you can order food in Instagram. I have never managed to find out how they do it, but they do it. If we don't have everybody using the same technologies and we use data-driven methods, we have a huge potential for increasing uh, disparity because the algorithm will have bias. You train the algorithm, the machine learning, to the data you have. But if there are people who are not representing that data, you will be actually putting a bias into it. And that was everything. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before we I invite the next speaker, I'd like to, uh, for the audience to take note and for questions, and we keep it at the end. So please, if you have questions for Dr. Luke and all the other speakers, keep them at, at the end, okay? Thank you. So now I invite to the, to the podium Ms. Lina Murad uh, for the, um, Abu Murad for the Ministry of Public Health, the National Health Program. Thank you. The Minister of Health was one uh, of the pioneers in the public administration that started uh, to work on digitization and automation of its work and processes. The journey towards uh, digitization started early in mid-90s and uh, several applications and information system were, uh, have been implemented. This is uh, some examples of uh, the information systems that were set in the ministry. In 2013, the national program for e-health was established with the main objectives to improve the quality and accessibility to healthcare, to improve patient safety, to facilitate access to services, to healthcare services, to increase transparency and to ensure equity. And of course, to empower patients. We started developing mobile health. Till now, we have three mobile health uh, for the ministry. The first was developed in 2013, and the latest was uh, launched two, uh, some several days ago, the eHealth Lebanon Mobile Health. Uh, these, uh, these mobile health uh, applications uh, increase the access to information and to services equ by equitable to all the citizens and uh, enhance e-government channels and facilitate com the communication with all the citizens. Also, we are using the social media and the website, uh, and we are giving much more important importance to transparent communication using these t tools. And recently, we have uh, tried to increase the awareness campaigns and the promotion, health promotion, using our social media. So any citizen can communicate easily with the, uh, with the ministry. And in addition, uh, we have a call center available 24 hours to receive complaints or any feedback from the citizen. And the strategy Health 2025 uh, launched last year, the patient is centric. And the eHealth has a large part of initiatives in this strategy. We started implementing some initiatives, some new projects, uh, the first one was the implementation of 2G barcode on pharmaceutical products to ensure patient safety and to ensure the quality of pharmaceutical products. This is a tool to track and trace all the pharmaceutical products in the supply chain of the pharmaceuticals. Uh, the pilot 
project started early in 2018 and will start implementation, the real implementation in 2019. Several, uh, uh, several companies, pharmaceutical companies, are included in this pilot test to try the information system. Also in the strategy, we have developed a new emergency response and crisis management plan. And for this, we have de developed an, inter uh, an artificial intelligence, intelligence using the mobile application uh, to determine the nearest and most adequate hospital for the patient. This project is done in collaboration with the Lebanese Red Cross and the private and public hospitals. It, uh, a, a platform was developed and we give access to all the hospitals and the Red Cross in order to, uh, uh, to uh, reduce morbidity and mortality and to protect the human dignity. This, also this project, start, we started piloting uh, two months ago and now we are trying to uh, assess uh, its uh, also, a trial uh, phase for the telehealth was completed, and uh, two primary health care centers linked to three university hospitals were put in place and connected through this telehealth system. And uh, after the trial phase has, uh, was completed, we have uh, some uh, facts that 30% of patients' visits went through the telehealth, 67% of surveyed patients believe telehealth is effective, while 80% of doctors believe specialization should be covered. And we think also the most of the personnel think that awareness and campaigns and communication would further boost patient visits. Now we are in the pilot phase. We are piloting this uh, tool in 25 uh, uh, primary health care, one primary health care per district. And the universal health coverage uh, draft law, uh, it was amended by the Minister of Health to implement the EMR integration. And if this law will be adopted, so we will integrate the electronic medical record for all the Lebanese uh, citizens uh, in, into one database, one central database that connect the primary health care centers, the private and public hospitals. Of course, all this work have been done in the Ministry of Health. We've been facing and still facing some of the challenges. One of the most challenged is the current organization structure of the Ministry of Public Health that is dated back to 1961. Uh, we are operating with very limited resources, I mean human and financial resources. The decline of the number of staff represents a serious threat for the sustainability of MOPH performance. Uh, from 2,600 into last decade to less than 1,000 staff. So this represents a serious uh, challenge. Also, the political instability in the country, the legal framework, uh, it is uh, very old. Our regulations are old. The, do not meet the new needs and the new requirements for the e-health and the technology. Uh, and we have also a challenge related to the culture because all the time there is a resistance from the staff and from the stakeholders, mainly the health professionals, and this is due to some reasons like the lack of skills and expertise and the motivation and some Sometimes they had a bad perception about e-health. So uh, I would like to thank you, and uh, I, I hope this was uh, helpful. And uh, this is.
Thank you very much for being a wonderful presenter on time. So she managed to keep her time. Thank you very much again. So again, now we'd like to introduce the, um, the speech by Dr. Andre Müller uh, from the University of Singapore. So please take a seat on the podium. Um, if you have questions, as I said before, please keep them for the end. I have several questions, but I would like to ask the audience to speak later on. So as soon as we are ready to start, we can move on with the, the presentation then. All right. So thanks for inviting me to Beirut. It's my first time here, and I'm pretty excited. And uh, I also noticed that I'm probably the youngest speaker uh, during the event, which is slightly boring, but which also meant my bio was very short, which was probably great for the uh, session chair. Um, as you already heard, I mean physical activity and sedentary behavior research. And uh, what I'd like to do before we actually start off with my talk, I want you to all stand up because I want to save your lives. Because we know sedentary behavior is a very independent risk factor of many diseases and health conditions. So if you can, if you're not injured, please stand up. And it also gives me a little bit of a standing ovation, which I seldomly get. Okay, great. Can you still see them? Yes, okay, good. Okay. So thanks for joining me. No, you can stay, 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 stay. Five minutes, five minutes. Yeah, you need about five minutes. You can, I, I try to signal you after five minutes if I don't forget. Then you can sit again. Okay, great. So thanks for joining me in discussing ENM health related to physical activity and diet in lower middle income countries and a little bit beyond. So as we all know in the room here, development and globalization has many bright sides. There's improved security, uh, food security, improved medical care, improved hygiene and sanitation, which means populations are generally healthier. There's also improved economic opportunities, which means living standards are increasing generally. But what we tend to neglect is there is also a very dark side to development and globalization. And this dark side is related to a shift of populations to unhealthy diets, and to less physical activity. In 2006, Popkin uh, coined the term pattern for nutrition transition, which meant that as countries develop, diets shift, unfortunately, to in an unhealthy direction, and which means that non-communicable diseases start to spread. There's also an interesting number here, but between 1999 and 2012, about 5% increase in terms of uh, processed food was observed in lower middle income countries in Asia. So generally, as countries develop, develop uh, diets don't get better. But there's also a reduction in physical activity in all domains, and we especially see it in the domains of work. We don't need to do much physical work anymore to get our stuff done. And we also see this in the area of transport, where we don't need to use our muscles very much anymore to get from point A to point B. And that's why you're now standing, actually, because you're doing some good thing for your health. So you can thank me later for that. Never mind. <laughs> Okay, and the consequences of uh, these transitions are quite dire. We see increases in overweight and obesity. This is just a picture from Southeast Asia here. This is where I currently work. And you see about 44% of Malaysians are currently overweight or obese. This makes them the number one in Asia. But my wife, who's Malaysian, is not part of that group, fortunately, or not yet. Hopefully never. The other consequences an increase in non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, cancer, and cardiovascular diseases. But fortunately, we have an opportunity in ENM health, or electronic and mobile health. That means we can use technology to actually deliver behavioral health interventions to improve physical activity and diet behaviors. And I say this, and this has been mentioned before, because technology uptake and availability is actually increasing a lot in lower and middle income countries. For example, about 90% of all people in low middle income countries have access to at least a mobile phone. 44% in Asia Pacific have access to the internet. And even more encouraging, mobile broadband subscriptions actually increasing much faster in lower middle income countries than in high income countries also because of falling prices. So we have an opportunity here to efficiently and cost effectively deliver interventions also to people we couldn't reach before with primary, intervention, uh, prim uh, primary prevention interventions. And this has been picked up by the research literature. All sorts of ENM health studies have been done, and we could probably look through this research literature for a couple of years. But was I, what I was more interested in is how's the research landscape in terms of physical activity and diet related to ENM health on a global level, and how much of this research is actually happening 
in low and middle income countries. And here's the very sad result. Between 2000 and 2016, there were 1,700 papers published on ENM health related to physical activity and diet. But unfortunately, only 53, uh, 53 studies were conducted in upper middle or lower middle income countries. So that is less than 3%, and that's actually very sad. I have highlighted here Malaysia with seven studies, and I think I contributed half of them. And I've highlighted Lebanon, and I guess Marco probably did all of these studies. You're the big, you're the big player. Great, excellent. Uh, the other question, you can actually sit now. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome, you're welcome. So I saved your life. And the other question you might have, are there actually interventions to improve physical activity and diet interventions in lower middle income countries? And how effective are these interventions? And I have quite another more or less sad news because we conducted such a study and finished this in 2016 where we looked into the effectiveness of ENM health interventions to improve physical activity and diet behaviors in lower middle income countries. And we only found 15 studies. And always keep in mind that 80% of the world population lives in lower middle income countries. And also keep in mind, when you do such a research in the rest of the world, you will find hundreds of more studies, so from high, middle in uh, high income countries. The studies use mainly SMS and internet technologies, so te uh, generation one technologies, which is again a bit sad considering that the uptake of the newer generation uh, te uh, two technologies is actually much faster in lower middle income countries. Studies was seldom be theory driven. And this probably is also related to the fact that most people that run these studies in lower middle income countries are actually medical doctors who are not necessarily trained in behavioral change theory and practice. And this is probably why Marco is doing really good work on that um, because he's actually trained in that as far as I know. And most medical doctors are actually not that don't really understand the cognitive process that go on in behavior change interventions. On the plus side, and finally some good news here after I've saved your life, which was good news as well, that 50% of the interventions that tried to improve physical activity were actually effective, and also 70% of the interventions had positive effects on diet quality. So there's some good news here. What I wanted to do next is to actually show you a scaled up intervention for physical activity that actually worked on a population level. Now I've looked through the literature and I've tried to find something, but I couldn't. There was just nothing out there that have done anything on a population level to improve this very important health behavior of physical activity. So I had to go back and say, okay, I might just show you something from Singapore and then we could just think about if that could work potentially in other settings as well. So I decided to introduce to you, to you the National Steps Challenge, which runs every six months for six months. And season four, which is the fourth season of this whole initiative, just started a week ago. And in season three, there were more than 600,000 participants. So as you know, Singapore is very small. That meant about 15% of the whole Singapore population took actually as part in this physical activity initiative. The Health Promotion Board basically gives people free fitness trackers and an app, and these can then be paired so they communicate with each other. But you can also use your own tracker. Then you can just collect steps and your heart rate data as you go about your daily life and try to achieve as many steps and as many time and higher heart rates as possible. When you do that, you actually get health points. And these health points can be used to redeem rewards for, or, or vouchers for sports retailers and so forth. So it's a pretty simple idea. I wish I could share with you now, and this is the other Thing that probably I can't do today, any results in terms of how effective or efficient these things actually, or this, this initiative actually is. We currently just have the data and try to make sense of it, as you can imagine, when you have 600,000 participants and you have uh, billions or millions, no, not just millions, but thousands of variables, it's probably quite difficult. And we are trying to link this data up with health outcome data to find out, is this actually working? But nevertheless, I thought I'm just gonna show you a study that has also been conducted in Singapore which resembles this challenge quite closely. In this study, 800 people were randomized into four groups, a control group, a group that received the fitness tracker, the Fitbit, a group that received the Fitbit and cash rewards for achieving step targets, and a group that received the Fitbit 
and also donations were made to charitable organizations when people re uh, reached certain step targets. And I've highlighted here especially the group that received the Fitbit and cash rewards because the, the, the old rationale is that when we give people actually money and something tangible, people might actually change their health behavior. And this is true on the short run, as you can see here, that people actually increase their activity levels quite a bit. But once the incentive sees, the effect ceases as well, which is probably quite sad. And we probably need to rethink how we do this, but this is why behavioral scientists are very important when you develop interventions. Okay, in conclusion, there's only about, or there are only about 3% of the overall ENM health physical activity and diet research coming out from non-high income countries. And this is actually very dissatisfying considering that these interventions are very needed in these countries where non-communicable diseases are spreading like nobody's business. There's also some evidence highlighting that these uh, interventions can be effective in promoting physical activity and diet. And we could think about scaling these up, but probably we need to get a bit more evidence from other countries or uh, try to scale them up first, you know, uh, uh, try to make bigger studies so to see if this actually works on a bigger population level. And finally, there are some somewhat successful initiatives from high income countries where we don't actually know if they work. And we could ask the question, is it a good idea to copy and paste it? Can we do this? Do we have the resources and the infrastructure in place? And do we anyway want to do that? Thank you so much. Thank you once again. So our next speaker is Mr. Jihad Flayan from Nextcare. So as we before, please keep your questions for later. And the floor is yours. As you, the pointer is on the desk there. So, uh, my name is Jihad Flayhan. I'm the general manager for Nextcare Lebanon. For those who don't know what Nextcare is, we are a third party administrator. We are the leading third party administrator in the, in the country. We are present in 13 countries, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, Egypt, uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait, uh, Kenya, Iraq, and now we're expanding towards uh, Asia Pacific. So what, client, what the client needs from us is three things. He wants the best service with the best, with the lowest cost, and definitely he needs the widest network of providers to have access for. During this presentation, we're gonna talk together and we're gonna show you how we see the future and the impact of digitalization on the customer journey and on the healthcare access uh, to providers, whether hospitals or centers or um, clinics or whatever the clients is in need for. So let's see the video first, and then we're going to discuss what's the roadmap for next care and how we see it in the future. Nara, 29 years old. Woke up feeling tired and warm. She checks her temperature and it is 38.9. She grabs her smartphone, opens Nextcare mobile app, and wakes Sarah, the smart bot, and starts a chatting conversation. To be able to diagnose not a symptom, the smart chatbot Sarah offered help by suggesting the symptom checker, or to speak to a doctor via video consultation, or to book an appointment. Nada chooses the symptom checker and start answering the straightforward questions.
At the end of the conversation, Sarah advises Nada to see a doctor. Nada goes to the video consultation option and she is directly connected to Dr. James. After a few questions, Dr. James confirms the diagnosis and provides a prescription accordingly. As soon as the video consultation is ended, Nada receives the prescription on the app and requests a home drug delivery. She can also track the drug delivery service via the app. Fifteen minutes later, the medicine is delivered at the comfort of her home. She will now recover quickly. She searches for a specialist. The app suggests a near hospital and Nada books an appointment immediately. The app offers to book a cab to go to the hospital. She confirms a cab to pick her up from home. Thanks to NextCare mobile app, Nada is always reminded to book her appointments and follow up with her doctor during her whole pregnancy period. Nine months later, Nada delivers a healthy newborn baby. So, Nada wants everything in a push of a button. Not Nada Sharara, Nada the, the famous Nada here. So, what does she want from us? She wants us to get her connected to the provider, to get her connected to the doctors, and to get her connected to the insurance company. And that's the roadmap I was talking about, and that's where we're going with next care and definitely our main stakeholders which are the hospitals and the doctors so plan one is nada wants to get connected to providers that's our platform pulse it's connecting the word pulse is a platform whereby any patient holding next care insurance card can access any provider any contracted provider in the world so the patient doesn't have the hassle to call the insurance company if he's in France, in Europe, in America, in Asia, wherever he wants. If, if the provider is contracted, any card holder, insurance card holder from Nextcare can access the provider. And all data behind this, there is a huge engine working on policy conditions and benefits. So the system will tell the provider and the client if he's covered or not. This is on the provider side. On the physician side, Nada wants to call the physician through teleconsultation and gets the uh, consultation on the phone while sitting on the chair watching TV. She has a fever, she has a headache, so she needs to get consulted with by a doctor. So Nada, next care facilitates Nada to have this option by having a provider portal and Physician portal. Physician portal is a portal whereby the doctor will have the whole medical file, medical record for the patient. And the patient, as well, will have his medical record on his mobile phone. He doesn't have to go back and forth to the providers to get all the results. All the results will be on his mobile app. All results will be on his insurance card. He can go to the provider even if he doesn't have the insurance card, his e-card, with next care e card is an insurance card over the phone. You don't have to have an insurance card anymore. You can go to any doctor, any pharmacy, any clinic, and with this, with the mobile app, you can go and access and get your medication. So this is for us the future. This is what the client needs. And believe me, if I say it's huge, there is a huge difference between what was in the past and what's waiting us for us in the future. I think we're coming to a point where the client wants to get treated at home. Number three, and I want to close with this, is we got the patient connected to the provider, we got him connected, connected to the uh, physician, and definitely he wants to get connected to the insurance company. He doesn't want to go on back and forth, he doesn't want to visit the insurance company on each and every reimbursement claims. So. We're going to go together and say, before saying thank you, we're going to go together to see our mobile app and see the features that the client might have if he has this mobile app on his phone.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So we have now the last speaker, last uh, but very important speaker, Jeff Harmon from uh, Epic. As you probably know, in AUBMC is soon moving to Epic. Uh, about 34 hours and 56 minutes. Okay, this so exactly <laughs> the countdown is there. You know, <laughs> the clock is ticking. So without much further ado, I introduce you to Jeff Harmon. Please, the floor is yours as soon as you're ready. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Jeff. Um, I'm a clinical lead and project manager for the EPIC implementation um, here at AUBMC. I've also had the opportunity to collaborate with the GHI um, on another project. I'm not going to go into that today. Um, my goal today is really to talk about how eHealth um, can be implemented in low resource settings, because I think we've done it. Um, we've certainly done it um, in the United States and in Europe where there are more resources, but that shouldn't be a limitation. So and I'll, I'll, I'll go into a couple examples here in a little bit. Before I dive into that, um, I, I do want to preface this by saying a lot of these are concepts. So these are concepts that maybe Epic has implemented, but they can be applied in other scenarios and situations. So a little bit of background. Um, who is Epic? What is Epic? We are a software company. Um, we actually like to think of ourselves as more of a software factory. We have developed all of our own products. So one of our points of, of pride is that we've never acquired another company or product. So everything um, out there is something that we've developed ourselves. Um, let's see, we were founded in 1979 um, by Judy Faulkner, who's still our CEO and president. Um, Judy's background is in math and science. I think that is another thing that kind of distinguishes Epic from a lot of other vendors out there. Um, it's that you know she was one of the original coders of our product. So we really do have a really strong corporate philosophy. Um, we try and foster innovation and create a culture where that's possible. So what do we actually do? Um, at Epic, we develop and we produce electronic medical records. So we started in outpatient clinics. Um, that's where we got our start. Over time, we have developed and implemented a full enterprise suite of products. Um, that extends to the hospitals, to the revenue cycle, to scheduling and access. And right now, a major focus for us is on interoperability and really promoting the patient experience. So I'd actually like to replace the word electronic medical record or electronic health record with comprehensive health record. Um, I, I think that we really need to move beyond the traditional walls of healthcare to make a, a broader impact on populations. So to that point, there was a study in 2002 that talked about the major factors that affect health. Um, and this may or may not be surprising. I think it's intuitive when we, when we step back and we think about it. Um, only 10% of the factors that actually impact health are services provided in healthcare facilities. 15% come from social interactions, 30% genetic disposition, and 40% personal behavior. So how do we incorporate these elements into the way we deliver healthcare? I think that's really one of the questions um, that we need to answer. To do that, we need to really empower the patient. So healthcare organizations should not be switchboard operators um, whose job it is to connect patients to providers or to services that they need for their healthcare. Um, I, I love this quote here. It's what you see as work, I see as freedom. I think this is so true uh, for the, the direction of e-health. Patients want to be empowered um, to manage their own health care. And when they do that, there's really uh, large opportunities for efficiency gains. So, you know, one thing that you can do with Epic um, and our patient portal uh, there's a product we have that's called FastPass, and that is essentially an auto wait list. So that, you know, there's certain specialties that might take months to get an appointment. Uh, dermatology is probably the best example where you might need to schedule out an appointment three months, four months, six months in order to get in. Um, with FastPass, patients can be put on a wait list, and if there's ever a cancellation, 
they can be sent a text message saying, hey, there's a cancellation at 3 p.m. today. Are you interested? Please reply yes to confirm your appointment. So again, we're keeping provider schedules full. Um, so we're really increasing the efficiency of the way healthcare is delivered. So patients are the key. Um, this is kind of a nice study from Kaiser Permanente um, that has shown how primary care has changed over time um, since their Epic Go Live. Um, and this goes all the way back to 2003. And you can see here that the amount of primary care delivered in the walls of the clinic um, has declined steadily as the patient portal and e-health has really expanded and grown. And e-health means a lot of things to me. Um, it could certainly include telehealth. Um, it can include pre-visit planning, so answering questionnaires. It can include scheduling appointments, paying your bills. Um, all of that's kind of bundled in what I think of as e-health. Um, so when you focus on e-health, you focus on that patient portal and really empowering the patient to manage their own care, um, efficiency, efficiency increases. One last product that I wanted to mention today um, that I think is really critically important in low resource settings um, is a concept called Share Everywhere. And this is really what, uh, this is really our solution to improve continuity of care around the world. So not just within a single healthcare organization or within a single country, but really anywhere in the world with an internet connection. So what this is, is any patient with an Epic Health record can go see a provider and they can share that record with them. And it's, it's the complete full health record that's documented, the single list of allergies, the single list, the single problem list, single medication list. Um, and any provider with internet access can review that and they can add a note. Again, the, the whole goal is to improve continuity of care. So especially in, in low resource settings where you may have a more transitory population, migratory, moving around, um, I believe this is really important. So kind of in summary, when we empower patients and we keep them engaged and the patient experience improves, we can keep patients healthy um, as opposed to fixing them when they're sick. And this is really one way that we can save money and be more efficient as uh, deliverers of healthcare. Okay, here, a uh, couple more slides. Um, I think I actually mentioned this in my opening slide, so kind of what is my relationship with AUBMC and the Global Health Institute? Um, I've had the opportunity and the privilege to work on the implementation uh, here at AUB. Uh, it's been a great experience. And I'm really honored to have, to have worked with this great group. And I, as I mentioned before, uh, we have a project that we're collabor collaborating on with the Global Health Institute right now. Okay, so I'm gonna I'll leave us with this question. So is e-health sustainable? And what are my recommendations for making that happen? Um, I've been doing this for about 10 years. Um, so I've kind of seen the industry change and grow. And so these are probably the three things that I called out that I think are most important. These are lessons learned um, that in countries and in regions that may not be as familiar with uh, the concept of an electronic medical record, focus on these at the beginning um, and you won't make the same mistakes that a lot of uh, developed countries have made getting to where we're at today. So first and foremost, create standards and follow the rules of the road. So this shouldn't be about any one vendor or any one system, but when you follow the rules of the road um, and, you, and you create those standards, anyone can plug and play and data can be shared seamlessly. My second piece of advice is to stand on the shoulders of others. So don't recreate the wheel. There's a lot of healthcare organizations um, that have implemented a solution and learn from them. Don't try and do this from the ground up. It's very painful. I've done it many times. Um, and then the, the, the last piece here is use apps and web, service, web services as a supplement to a core health record. So have a really strong central database and then build on top of that. Build your clinical decision support on top of that. Build other pieces on top of that. Um, and again, if you have those rules of the road and you, you've created those standards, uh, that's much easier to do. 
Um, I, I did just share the final statistic here about interoperability and information exchange. It shows um, you know, how we can reduce duplicate procedures from being performed, shows how much money can be saved um, when interoperability and information is exchanged freely. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, Jeff. So I'd like to, um, to start a discussion, I think, reflecting back on the, the three E's that we mentioned at the beginning, so the equity, empowerment, and efficiency. I think we, from the, the speeches we have so far listened to, uh, we can ensure that e-health is securing efficiency, is, uh, giving, uh, is making people becoming empowered, let's say, or this is the assumption we make. But what about equity? So uh, this is a question that I open to all the panelists. How can we ensure equity through e-health solutions? So what's your take? Uh, I can give some ideas, some comments. In public health, we speak all the time about health literacy, right? It seems that we forget about digital health literacy. So how can we push technology, either internet, and we don't teach people how to use internet safely? How we are not explaining to the healthcare professional or the patient how to find out whether you can trust this app or the other. And also literacy is not only health, but also those working in technology, they need to understand the needs of the health domain. So basically it's education that, in my opinion, and normally is always forgotten. And it's not education one time off. This is an evolving technology, so you need to keep educating because technology is changing. And the way the technology is used is also evolving. At least that will be my main piece of advice. Yes. Um, from an insurance perspective, it's the equity is there. So everyone is getting the same benefits, uh, the same uh, access, the privilege uh, to healthcare providers. We don't have people who can use the e-card and other people don't. So whether you're insured or not, if you're insured, you're getting the same benefits across the board. So uh, I don't see from a, from our industry, I don't I don't see it as a problem. So there's not there is no challenge uh, in this in that regard. Yeah, again, I can I can just talk about like um, how I see equity in M health for physical activity, diet, or behavioral health and. I don't think we have, and as I've presented it, achieved yet, and I'm not sure if we will achieve it because uh, what happens in, at the moment is that we use the most advanced technologies um, for our studies at the moment, like trackers and apps and all these kind of things, but we actually tend to not realize that these things are, although they are being taken up in lower middle income countries as well, but I don't think the uptake is... Um, that we can actually implement these interventions in low middle income countries in a way that we do it in high income countries. So yeah, I'm I'm not so I'm not so sure about how to actually uh, reach equity with E and M health as of yet. For the Minister of Public Health, eligibility for the citizens is equal for uh, all the citizens that does not have another uh, uh, another uh, insurance public or private so uh, and we are trying with our uh, mobile application released uh, several uh, days ago the digital for the digital services to give access to all the citizens to apply for their services online with the detailed information about the rules and the eligibility criteria so to, to, uh, to, to everybody to be aware uh, about all this. Sure. I, I guess the only other thing that I'll add, um, I touched on it a little bit at the end of my presentation, is again, when we follow standards, we create standards when we're designing these systems, um, we can design them fairly, we can design them equitably, um, so that we don't have the concept of data blocking. I think that's, that's kind of a buzzword in the United States right now. Um, when health systems or companies become pr treat data proprietarily health data, um, I think that's when inequality um, kind of can arise up in the system. So when we have those standards and we know exactly how to transfer allergies from one system to another system 
or the problem list or the medication list, when that's clearly defined and spelled out, I think we can at least attempt to increase equity. Okay, thank you very much. I wanted to build upon the uh, response of Dr. Fernandez Luca about the uh, health literacy. It's a concept that we share with our students here in AUB also. Uh, it's about the ability to understand and to action, let's say, take actions about our own health. It might be talking about different things, about physical activity, it could be about getting a flu shot or vaccination and so on. Um, this relates to my point of being more equitable as uh, he health researchers, he health provi providers. Is uh, the concept of providing access that is, uh, I say, at the same time equitable and also more accepted. Um, I'm not sure. Let's say we are still yet we are there yet in terms of m ensuring acceptance in terms of uh, from the from the user's point of view. I think this is one of the elements that we need to, to discuss or think about. How can we ensure that our solutions are acceptable? Or how can we make sure that they can become acceptable for the majority of the people so that we can ensure equi equitable access? What do you think? Or any one of you can think about this, of course. All right, you got up again. That's great. <laughs> um, what we usually do is when we develop technologies, we usually go into the actual uh, population that we want to access and uh, we do qualitative studies um, where we let people actually voice out what they really think about what we have developed because normally as, as researchers we think our ideas are great and they work super well and they're super acceptable because they make complete sense to us. But when we actually encounter the actual population and we ask them, oh, just, can you just use the app? And they have usually no idea how to do that. So normally what we do in a kind of systematic way, we go in, we show them the app or whatever we have developed, and then they tell us really what they think about it when they're using it. Because what, what happens actually normally with, um, with all these apps, and at least in my area, when people don't understand it within like the five or 10 seconds, they don't touch it ever again, and the app is gone forever. So in order to prevent that, we actually do go this extra step of qualitative research, understanding what the users actually think and of what we thought is a great idea. From, from up. Uh, from our experience, it's it's matter of culture, first of all. Okay, so um, we're gonna discuss now our experience with the mobile app. We have more than 500,000 insured on the next umbrella. We have only 10,000 who have downloaded the mobile app. So it's a matter of culture. Number two, the challenges that we're facing is the infrastructure challenges. In Beirut, you can have internet. In the suburban areas, you can't have internet. And above all, the internet is really, really expensive. So sometimes we try to get the internet for the client, just download the app. So it's a matter of culture, it needs time. Uh, how you measure it is the response of your clients and the penetration rate. So this is how we monitor the responsiveness of our clients, whether they feel like this tool is really adequate for them or not. We are on the right track. I think now if you watch the TV now, every single ad, it's about mobile app. So we're, we're going there. We're definitely going there. It needs time maybe longer than the, the countries around us. So that's, that's our way of, of measuring things. I can comment a little bit. In telemedicine and health, there have been actually for, I think, the case already, something called a technology acceptance model. And actually, there are two main factors. Usability, as in the health domain, is horrible. I mean, think of, in Europe, so many apps. My father has a little bit family tremor, me too. So many apps, it's very hard. The buttons are tiny. People tend to forget that people with a chronic condition may have E co eye conditions, or maybe they don't see well. So it's actually, they're, they're a nightmare to navigate. And that's pure ground design. I mean, that's something that, as he mentioned, you have to do properly design. If it is horrible to use, they will never use it. Or they will use it very little, and you are increasing inequality, because those that will use it are the more technical savvy, with high income and high education. So that's usability. The second thing is utility. I have been in many projects where people say, let's put a reminder of vaccination, let's put a reminder, so it's like the shopping list. The more things you put, the better. 
at the end they end up with a solution with many functionality that is useless, that don't solve a problem. So utility and usability. And they have to start in the early beginning. And it will change from one population to the other, from one culture to the other. So that has to be done. And sometimes, I will say most of the times, that's forgotten. And the end result, people don't use it. Thank you very much again. Yeah, I 100% agree with the concept of designing for simplicity and designing for usability um, and, and certainly soliciting feedback. When we get a new phone, we're not sent, there is a training companion. I, I don't know if anyone here has ever actually read through the whole tra training companion or when your phone uh, has another upgrade or an update. It, it just happens and we're all, we're, we're all able to figure that out and that's because Apple has designed products that are simple and intuitive so I think we need to keep that in mind and keep that, that usability concept in mind when we're designing apps and when we're designing solutions. They should be simple and they should be easy to use. Okay, thank you very much again for, for the contributions. Now, I would like to open the floor uh, for questions. There's a question over there and a question over there. I think we can take three, four questions, Max. You have four minutes. Please, you know how we get to the microphone? Oh, it's there, okay. Four, one over there, ready over here. Yeah, this, this question is to Jeff from Apex. Yeah, I, I, I'm really surprised that uh, you're talking about the Apex for the uh, uh, low and lower and middle income countries. Uh, even Thailand, I come from Thailand, the world class hospital are talking with Apex and they cannot afford that. Only Singapore. Yeah. And this is a, uh, uh, so I wonder that what version that you are talking about the uh, the uh, uh, the epic for the uh, less resource uh, uh, countries and uh, wh wh one an another thing is that I, I heard that the epic will not work with the country that don't use English and Thailand uh, trying to use a kind of the, this the world class the application but we cannot do that thank you. So great questions. Um, I'll be brief and we can follow up after the session for more detailed response. Um, Epic has recently moved to more streamlined products. So we have the concept of Sonnet, Utility, and Full Enterprise. So previously we only offered Full Enterprise and that was Epic with all the bells and whistles. Um, we're now offering more slimmed down products um, that just meet basic needs. Um, with regards to internationalization um, and translation, um, we are live in a, a number of countries that don't speak English, um, but we're not fully committed to translating all of Epic yet. So AUB was a really good fit um, because they're an academic medical center, they do a lot of research, and they deliver healthcare in English. So that, that was easy. Um, I personally worked on the Denmark project, um, and we did have to translate their version of Epic to Danish. Um, so we, it's a little bit of a mixed bag, um, but I think it's something that we're interested in exploring more. Thank you. We have a question from Lady okay. here. Uh, hi. Um, I have a question to Ms. Lina. Um, you talked about e-health and you said that um, e-health basically helps us identify uh, the uh, best uh, and the nearest hospital for patients if they are suffering from something, if I understand correctly. And I'm just trying to see who is eligible for this. So are we talking about people that have no money to access hospitals? Or are we talking about people that have uh, NSSF coverage, private or public? This is my question for you. And my question to Mr. Jihad is, how is it equitable, the application that you have built for people that have zero money and still wants to access health? And how is this really equitable and how do they really have access to health, if any, because we're talking about uh, vulnerable you know, countries, people from coming from low income countries, you know, they, don't, they don't have money. Not everyone have money to be covered by health. So how do you go about with that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe we'll take another question. One, one last then question, then we then answer. Yes, thank you. Uh, again, uh, I am Dr. Sudhir Satpati from India. I have two questions. One is what we are observing in low and middle income countries using digital, digital technology is mostly for curative services. They're providing information service and contacting physicians, etc. 
but I want to know both from Lina and uh, Luis that what extent actually we are contributing to this uh, digital health uh, in prevention and promotion. So that is first question. Second question is how we can utilize this digital technique in improving health literacy. Chair has pointed out that one is very much. So the two questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So one last question, and then we move to the answers. We have a, a microphone for here. Just a second. Uh, for Dr. Fernandez, uh, you talked about ingestion of social media. We now have lots of software out there. They're using in political campaigns for influencers. Social media is ingested. They identify who the influencers are, and you pay Kim Kardashian $100,000, and she tells you to stop smoking. Have, has there been any research done on ethics with using the influencers? Like it works in the case of smoking cessation, but if you ask a warlord to stop doing what they're doing, or their followers to stop doing, it may have unintended consequences. Has that been looked at at all? Okay. I can answer the questions that you have made to me very quickly. So actually, social media has been used to promote the smoking. So they go to influencers in many countries and they are promoting a smoking in social media. Uh, public health officials, uh, it's very challenging and it's very hard to answer your question because it depends a lot on the country. For example, in Sierra Leone, social media was pretty much not used, but there was a lot of chatter in WhatsApp. And WhatsApp is completely a black box. So there is no way you can do analytics. In there, maybe you can do it morally if you get into the group without the permission of everybody, uh, but it's really a black box and we don't know what is going on. Twitter, Facebook, and so on, you can do some things, and I can give you more information la later on if you want. And regarding your question about how you can use it more for promotion and so on, actually the, the ITU together with the World Health Organization, they have a project that's called Be Healthy, and one of the samples they put is the use of SS SMS for a smoking cessation, and that was done in India. So you can do those, use those technology for health promotion too. And SMS can be very cheap. And I can give you also some uh, pointers later on. But there are samples. Okay, thank you. We, we can maybe answer now the question about the equity of access for those who do not have the funds, yeah. the money to sustain. I'm, I'm not sure I got your question well, but from my side, we're talking about the insurance industry. Okay, so people who have insurance will have this mobile app. So I don't see any money issue on this. The mobile app is for everyone, it's for free. And uh, the access they can have over the phone can have through a mobile app. So I don't see, if I got your question well, it's not a matter of, of money. It's instead the challenge is somewhere else. Uh, this is what I've mentioned before. The challenge is, is, is in the culture, is in the country, in the internet cost, and the internet uh, capacity and capabilities. So it's a technology issue. I don't see any uh, money issue in this, unless I got your question wrong. I'm not sure that people can hear, but what probably she is saying is that we are targeting people that do not have access to healthcare because they cannot afford it. So how can an um, we ha health we have, can do we that? Have, we have an experience now. We're, we're managing the uh, uh, UNHCR, the Syrian refugees, 1.5 million they're on Lebanon. None of them has an insurance card. They don't have a mobile app, and they're having their access to the providers. We have what we call the web services with the, with the United Nations. So through his, only his, identity or what you call the, the certificate, he can access the provider. He doesn't need any money, he doesn't need no app, he doesn't need any healthcare uh, privileges. So that's, that could be a good example for you, if, if this suits you, uh, other than insurance. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, last comment from, the, from Ms. Melina. Thank you. As I understood your uh, question, it was about the emergency platform and who has access to it. It is a platform mainly for all the hospitals and the Lebanese Red Cross uh, for dispatching patients uh, when there is an emergency to know where is uh, uh, the most adequate hospital, the near ad most adequate hospital in order to uh, dispatch the patient. So uh, the, the data of the 
emergency room is updated regularly from all the hospitals in order to have uh, to have uh, all the services available in all the hospitals so the Re uh, Lebanese Red Cross or any patient, any citizen who has this mobile application can know in advance which hospital, which the nearest hospital have the availability of beds in emergency room and the other services in the hospital. Okay, thank you very much. That was the last answer. I think um, now uh, I'd like you to, to stay here for the next session. So thank you for the attention and for uh, the wonderful panelists that joined us today. So please, a round of applause for them. Thank you very much again.